My guest today is John Horner, and though we grew up in the same church, we lived in different cities, and so we didn't really know each other very well until I went to Graceland University and met Andy, John's younger brother, and had several classes with him. That's when I got to know John a little better, and I admired him so much because he was so dedicated to his writing. I hope you enjoy the show today. Welcome to Story Power, a bi-monthly podcast where my guests and I geek out about the stories we are passionate about in all different genres, styles, and formats. My name is Lucinda Sage Midgordon, and I started this podcast in the summer of 2020 at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. As I watched the reaction of my friends, family, and social media circle, I noticed that many people turned to stories for comfort and help in making sense of the craziness going on around them. My goal was to do the same for my listeners, but as I chatted with my guests throughout the first year, I discovered that their personal stories were the most fascinating thing about each episode. Neil Gaiman says, Fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. I now know that sharing our experiences with others helps us defeat our own dragons. It is our stories that connect us to one another. Let's see what wisdom today's guest has to share with us. Today is episode 47, and my guest is my friend. I've known John for a very long time. My guest is John Horner. John, welcome to the show. Hello. Good to be here. And John, I know that you and I have theater in common, but you have written plays, you've written poems, and in the summertime, you you graciously sent me your novel, What's the name of it again? Um, quiet, quiet at Leisure or Second Impressions. That's right. Quiet at Leisure or Second Impressions. And it is a kind of sequel to Pride and Prejudice. And I absolutely loved it. So uh, I'm hoping that you'll tell about your writing and how you got hooked on theater and stories and writing and and tell a little bit about your novel for sure but I know you have other writing things that you want to talk about so one of the main things I got to bring out is that my parents were both they just loved to read they they were reading all the time they would read to us uh, particularly (laughs) mom uh, and most every night she would she would come into our bedroom and read a story to us, or quite often we would ask her to tell us a story about when she was a little girl. And dad didn't read to us as much, but he loved to read and he, he loved to have his children read. And we, um, all four of us, of the siblings, read quite a bit. I'm actually not not reading as much, I think, as my brothers and my sister, because I'm so focused on the writing now. <laughs> Him and I, this this last few weeks, have been really going through our house, um, getting things straightened out. And we, we've got a lot of books that, uh, I mean, we have a huge number of books, um, but we've been going through... S- trying to decide which books we are never going to get around to reading or reading. Mm -hmm. And so we've been selling some of those to the half half price store, but mom and dad really loved to read. And one, one thing I remember is we, we had one of those little stands that you could write on. Uh It had the, um, alphabet around the outside of it Uh and I remember that there would be times when you know like just mom and I were there and she was sitting down 
And this was when, this was before even kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know how to read yet, but I, I, I would go up to the, to the stand and I would choose letters and put and, and write uh, these, this line of letters. And then I would turn to mom and ask her if that was a word. And uh, later she said that she was actually kind of amazed at how many times I actually came up with a word. Um, <laughs> even before I, I knew, was really aware of what letters sounded for what, mm -hmm. for what sounds. And, and, and then the, there was about when my sister Barb and I got our first uh, library cards. Oh yeah. We, we both wanted to be able to check books out. And in Boise at that time, the uh, children's department was, we'd go outside and go down a level. Oh. And that's where the children's department was set. And at that time, the only thing you had to do to get a library card in Boise was to write down, you know, fill out a form. And the final thing would be simply to write your name on the form. Mm -hmm. Well, Barb and I came up with an idea. We talked with mom because neither of us could write. We went to this to the library and mom uh, filled out the top stuff mm -hmm. and then came time for us to write our names uh, on the form. And so we, we were given the form and each of us reached into our pockets and we formed, we pulled out a piece of paper where mom had written our name for us and each of us followed what mom had written and wrote our names. And I put John Horner and Barb put Barbara Horner. And the, the librarian just looked at us with amazement. And she says, I don't think I've ever seen any children who wanted to be able to check out books like that. And, and they, they, she, she was just amazed that that we had come up with that way of, of getting our library card. So that was, that says something about the background out of which I come. We, we all, we all love reading. When I was, let's see, I, I started writing poetry in junior high school, but when I was in the fifth grade, I had taken a test in the fourth grade to be in a, this high level math program mm -hmm. that was not at every single school in Boise, but it was, if you passed it at a high, high enough level, you were invited to go to one of the schools, the nearest school that offered that program. We had just moved from downtown Boise back out to the outer part of Boise mm -hmm. to the property that mom and dad had had bought when they were first first came to Boise and they had rented it out when the our family started getting bigger and we had to move to a bigger place and I, I got I I got into this program so I I had to go start going to a different school from the one that Barb and Andy were going to. Oh yeah. And they had a great library there. And I started reading um, books about mythology. Oh yeah. And then in, by the sixth grade, they they had a they had a few scripts of Shakespeare's play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I started reading those. Now, I had. <laughs> Most of the stuff of the stories I didn't understand at that age. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I loved the sound that Shakespeare created in in the lines that he gave for the actors to read. And so I just really 
really fell in love with the lang the English language. Mm -hmm. And um, I started I started writing poetry in junior high school. And um, when I was in high school, I was one of a, a small handful of people of other students who um, went to this one competition for for it was for debate and also also for individual performances. Mm -hmm. uh, the the one that I went for was unpublished poetry, which oh. basically was the poetry written by the student and i remember one of the girls who she was the editor of the school newspaper oh uh huh and we went to this place to look at different books that we might might want to buy and i came across a book by a guy named Lawrence Ferlinghetti mm -hmm. and i i opened it up and started reading his poetry and I was amazed at how much the poetry I was writing at that time was similar to what he was, he was writing. Uh -huh. And so I, I turned to this, the one girl and asked her if she, if she knew who Lawrence Ferninghetti was. And she said, Oh yeah, yeah. He's a very good poet. And I said, I'm, I'm amazed at how much my my poetry seems like hers. He says, yeah. She said, yeah, I, I, I knew that. And that's why I kind of pointed you over there. And so I, I, I just fell in love with Lawrence Ferlinghetti's poetry. Several years later, when I had finished college, I'd spent a year out in the northwestern part of New York State. And when I left there, came back to Boise and there was one of the local bookstore owners had set things up to bring Ferlinghetti in for a reading. And I'm wow. So I I go to the place where I put all of my poetry collection. Uh -huh. I had about five or six of his books. And I just grabbed them all and I was going to go uh, take them with me to the possibility that I could get him to sign them. Then I realized, I thought, actually, that many might be too much. And so I, I, I picked up his, his best known work, which is the Coney Island of, of the Mine, and took it with me. And you know, got a got a place in the auditorium, and uh, he was introduced. He gave a, a, a wonderful poetry reading, and then the the host came out and said, uh, "I want to thank Mr. Ferlinghetti for coming. Um, for those of you who are interested, he will be out in the uh, lobby." willing to sign copies of his books. And if you don't have his books, um, there's another table where you can buy his books uh, to get them signed. And so I, I worked my way out slowly because there was quite a lot of people there. And the um, right ahead of me were like four older women, which I swear all four of them had blue hair. <laughs> they walked in and they went straight to the to the table to buy books and get we get in line for him to sign the books and he I can tell that he is quite bored by what's going on with the books I um, mean you know with the signing and stuff and so he um he he, he would sit there people would bring the book. He wouldn't even look at the people, <laughs> wouldn't even look at the book. He would just sign his name, hand it back. And finally, I get up to the front of the line and I pull out my old battered copy of Coney Island of the Mine and I hand it to him. And he actually looks down at it. And then he looked up at me 
Then he looked down at it again. Then he looked up at me and said, thank you. <laughs> and it, it seemed like I was the first person in, in to come through the line who actually had read uh -huh. his, his books. And so um, that was um, an important meeting for me. But I was in high school and in college. I did, I was an editor for creative writing and I enjoyed that. When I got to college, I went to Graceland College in Southern Iowa. And there they, they assign students, each, each student to a specific house. Uh, unless you get married, that was the only house that <laughs> right. stayed through the, your, your whole time there. And I was in Aaron House. And it turned out that Aaron House, about 90% of the male actors in, on campus lived in Aaron House. <laughs> and, um, you know, I got to, I got to uh, become friends with, with different ones. And there were these two guys that were a couple of years older than I was. They were, they were both juniors and I would, we, I would go into their place and we would talk and stuff. And they, uh, they more or less dragged me to the, auditions for the second play of the of the year and that was uh Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead oh yeah and I auditioned you know thinking there was no ch no chance that I would <laughs> anything but all the Shakespeare that I had read mm -hmm. people who are, are not aware of it Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead is is based on Hamlet, but from the point of view of two very, very unimportant characters. <laughs> and, that play, um, yeah. Yeah, and it, it's it's a wonderful play. The, the director, Celia Shaw. Yeah, I was going to ask you if Celia was the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, she was, she, she was at Graceland at the same time as a student as my parents. Uh, oh. After World War II. Oh, yeah. Their very first date, they went to see a play in which she played the villain. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so that, 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 was, that was, you know, something amazing. Um, yes, really. Later came back to Graceland and taught for a year. Uh, and, and so worked with Celia. Uh -huh. And that was great. But anyway, she cast me in two small parts. I just... I just fell in love. I mean, I, I had been in a few small plays mm -hmm. growing up, um, you know, and some stuff at church, but I just fell in love with the theater. And had they had a, a major at that time, mm -hmm. I would have gotten a double major for both English and theater. But as it is, I, I was the first person to get a minor in theater at, at Grace. Oh, cool. And there were amazing people there on the faculty at, at that time. One was Vilma Roosh. Oh, yeah, uh, I loved her. And when, after Himden and I got married, we made a trip up there for me uh -huh. to talk with her about some stuff. And I, I had been her assistant for one semester while, oh. while I was there. Uh -huh. And she's she was such a, a great teacher. Uh, I only took a, a few courses from her, mm -hmm. but one was religion in the world's great literature. Mm -hmm. I took that class too. Yeah, and then then you then you know what an amazing uh -huh. course that was. And when when we went up to Lamoni to talk with her, I think I gave her a draft of the book that I was writing and it was it was a collection of short plays for worship and it's called the the prayer of matthias oh yeah and she read the draft and i i asked her if 
if she could write the introduction, if she would be willing. And she was very willing. And, and I, I feel blessed that she wrote the introduction because she saw, she had insights into, into my writing that even I was not aware of. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 got, I got my major in English. I got a strong minor in theater. And from that, I, I started to do a lot of writing. I wrote my first plays at Graceland. One was called Arches, and it was a, a strange play. It's, it's based on the actual person for, that gives the basis for the Little Jack Horner. Little Jack Horner sat in a corner. Oh, right. Uh-huh. And I was intrigued about it because I found, I heard that, that most of those poems are based on actual things. And oh. there was a man who's, who was called Jack Horner. Mm-hmm. And what happened was that when the king decided to take control of all of the churches, he sent Horner out to collect the deeds for all of the churches. So that Henry VIII, now the story is that Warner kept one of those deeds for himself, didn't turn it in to, to the king. So I, I did, did what research I could, and I, it was the first play that I had written. Mm-hmm. And uh, Celia oversaw my writing of it. Oh, cool. She, she was very, very helpful in that. Uh, but that was, I, I did some really strange things. I wrote a lot of it in, in verse, but I had different kinds of verse for different characters to do. Oh, uh-huh. And um, so, you know, it's, it's an interesting play to read. Um, and I, I'm, I sometimes think about going back and reworking it and stuff. But uh, it was the first one that I that I had written, and uh, well, a few years went by, but before I started working on my my master's degree, that was at um, Central Missouri State University. That's what it was called then. One of the professors there was active in the uh, local theater. They were wanting to do a play on an actual event that had taken place in Warrensburg. And it was, it was about two brothers-in-law who didn't get along together. And one of them shot the dog of the other one. And uh, there were a lot of trials of <laughs> back and forth suing each other. Oh no. And the professor was that that term was heading up a program for playwriting. Mm-hmm. And he said um, that he he wanted all of us to work on coming up with ideas for the play. And the one that he liked best he would ask to write the play for the production. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I ended up writing a play called uh, Who Shot Old Drum? And um, he liked mine far better than anyone else's. And so I, I wrote the entire play and it was quite well received. And later when I went back through, after I got my doctorate, I found out that they had done another production of it. I pointed out to them that I still had the right to the play, not them. They had to, for if they were going to do it anymore, they they'd have to clear it with me. So anyway, it, it was it was it was great fun, but the professor thought that it, I should just be able to use that as my master's thesis. The other professors didn't want to let me do that since since it had not started out as that. And uh, so I wrote another play called Children of the Pelican 
uh, for my master's thesis, had to add some stuff as to what went into writing of the play and how I felt about how it worked out and stuff. That was that actually um, when I got to Santa Barbara, that was a, a play that I entered into a contest that was held at Santa Barbara every every year. And I tied for for best play. Oh, cool! And so that that was um, that was kind of satisfactory. But then there, the big thing was in the late eighties, the Community of Christ Church, the head historian for the church, knew of my my work as a you know in theater and and as a right and he convinced the leaders of the church that they should commission me to write a play for the founding of the Kirtland Temple. Temple. Mm-hmm. And well, I was preparing for both my final exams and starting work on my dissertation, but I, I worked on it. And then they, they hired me that, that summer to, cast it and direct it and when they hired me and I accepted it they said now we we need you to keep it to just four or five actors because we want to pay the actors a stipend (laughs) we don't have that much money and there's no way that you can tell that story with just four or five characters right and so as I was getting ready to write it, I I, I realized that in, in the playwriting program at the University of Santa Barbara, realized that I had directed two of the shows that playwrights, their one-act shows. One of them was a play within a play. And that that play within a play, when I accepted the commission to write the Kirtland, the Kirtland play, I realized that I can do it, making it a rehearsal. Each of them take way more than just one character Mm -hmm. and play several different characters. And then I realized that, I mean, the church was going through a lot of, a lot of stuff at that time. They, they had just opened it up for women to become part of the priesthood. Mm -hmm. And that was causing all sorts of, struggles within the church and a lot of church members left the church because they didn't think women should be be in that position and so one of the one of the main things i did was have the different actors in the framing play disagree with each other i set it up so that each of the four actors i i played the director <laughs> And each of the four actors would represent a different per- perception of what the story should be about. And so one was very, one end was very, very, very conservative. And at the other end, there was one who was uh, an atheist. And they disagreed. And in between, there were two, two people that were in the middle of the of the actors, two of the actors were men, though they were the two far ends of each other. Mm-hmm. The, two, the other two actors were women, and I was and I was I played the director, and I stepped in to play a couple of roles as as well. But it, it, it's also it's also kind of an education for the audience in acting. I'll go through the play in many different ways. And they they have arguments, they shout at each other, they they have laughter together, and and every single one of them, the the two men, the two women, and the director at the end of the play, uh, every single one of them plays Joseph Smith at least one time. Mm-hmm. And the Men play women, and the women play men, depending on what what the scene is and stuff. Mm-hmm. 
and there are some scenes that are very, very funny, and some scenes that are uh, heartbreakingly hard. And um, I, I was—it's very possibly the the best play that I've ever written, and I I got special citations from two different history organizations for, for the play. So, you know, that's, that's an important play um, for me. How, how are we on time? Do you want to tell about your novel? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, 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 will, I will just mention briefly, I, I rediscovered a lot of stuff that I had written on a children's play for adults called The Dancing Tyrant. And Hemda really wants me to finish that because she thinks that that could be well accepted. But the my my sequel to Pride and Prejudice started in a strange way. While Hemda and I were were dating, we stopped in at a, a used bookstore there in downtown Independence, and they had this big table that was just filled with paperback books and a little sign saying big sale 20 25 cents each wow. and we're, we're looking around and and i come across a copy of pride and prejudice and i hold it up for him to, to look at and i said remember the first time you read this and him to said i don't think i i've never read that I said, you've never read Pride and Prejudice? He says, no. So I generously reached into my pocket, pulled out a quarter, <laughs> and bought her Pride and Prejudice. Well, she she was going through some, some rough times right then, and reading Pride and Prejudice became very important for her. It took her to a different world, and... Over the next few months, we bought every single one of Jane Austen's major, major books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Emma read them all. I mean, and she, she became far, uh, far ahead of what I, what I was in terms of knowledge of the stories. I've, I've since read most of the books, but I, I came up with this idea for a book a sequel to Pride and Prejudice. And I'm not going to go into too much of the details and stuff of, of the story itself because I don't want to ruin it for possible readers, but there, there are twists and turns and stuff and some things that are very, very funny, some other things that are very, very tragic. Ape. But I, in in writing it, I came up with the, very last line before I started writing the book. I knew exactly how the how the book was going to end. <laughs> and it, it, it involves two, two characters uh, from Pride and Prejudice. I, I, bring, I bring a lot of other characters in, but I, I use um, I use a lot of the major characters from Pride and Prejudice. And I came up with that. And so I knew how the book was going to end. But as I wrote it, I, I met a number of different characters. And, and, and I found that one of the big things that I used in that came in the writing, in my understanding of the characters, was what I came from things that I had learned from my theater experience. And that is, you know, when you, when you get a good actor, you have someone who explores her or his character and gets to know that char character, discovers things from that person's past that are not in the script itself right yeah uh -huh. so which is which is one of the reasons that 
five different people can do the same play from Shakespeare and have five different, very, very different performances mm -hmm. that are all valid. Right. Yeah. That all work. And so as I was writing, you know, I, I discovered a lot of things about Mr. Bennett. Yeah, I liked him. I, I, I discovered a lot of things on Caroline Bingley mm -hmm. and, 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 and other characters that, that I've introduced. But some of those things that I discovered, it was important for me to write them in the drafts. Mm -hmm. But they don't do anything within the book that actually advances the story. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done a lot of uh, editing of my of the story uh, as I would go back and read it. Yeah, so you had to write a lot of things that you didn't necessarily keep in the book, but you had to know them yeah, about the, the characters. The things, yeah. that, things that I had to understand. About yes. That, you know, there, there's some places where, you know, several pages in a row I, I got rid of. Mm -hmm. But it was important for me as the author mm -hmm. to have made those discoveries about the characters right yeah even even though they're they're not necessary uh, to telling the story but right. they're still, they're still working their way around in 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 the story yeah i liked what you did with um uh, mr and mrs bennett and mary because mary doesn't get much time in the novel and then I think I was telling you one time when you and I were talking on the phone that there's a really recent play called Miss Bennett at Pemberley or something like that. And yeah. it's a play about Mary at Christmas yeah. time. It's about Mary Bennett at Pemberley at Christmas time. And yeah. so uh, my teaching partner, who is a professional, a theater professional, wanted to do that as his master's project but the Arizona Theater Company got the rights to it first. So, so he changed his, he had to change his project and, and he moved it to April instead of doing it in December. But yes, it's nice to know, because I do that a lot. I'll read a book or watch a movie and I'll say, I really liked that character, but we didn't get to know much about them. Yeah. And I liked the way you fleshed those characters out it's I mean there's not a whole lot of time in the book about Elizabeth and Darcy or Bingley and Jane yeah Jane right uh it's more about the kind of background characters and I really liked that that was one thing I liked plus I also liked that we had grandchildren that Mr. Bennett interacted <laughs> with his grandchildren yeah. a lot and that was cool so yeah I um w one of the things that uh, I'm very very pleased with is the fact that Mr. Bennett at the beginning of the book Mr. Bennett is walking through the area where his daughter is sitting reading a book. He walks past her, stops, comes back around, takes her book, gives her the book that he's carrying, kisses her on the forehead and says, my dear, it's time you find out how the other, other the rest of the world works. And then he goes back into his, his library. Yeah. And, and that action changes him, it changes her, it changes Mrs. Bennett, mm -hmm. and it, it, it moves out from there and changes the lives of more and more people. That, mm -hmm. one, that one moment, that one yeah. decision that he makes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that in Pride and Prejudice, that's all that Mary reads is Fordyce's sermons. Yeah. 
Yeah. So him taking that away from her and giving her a different book is really a significant thing. It's like he never noticed her before. And all of a sudden he's, he's like, you know, I never noticed Mary before. I guess I need to pay attention to her now that she's the only daughter left at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's one thing I, I, I love and enjoy so much in writing is making discoveries that I had not a clue to when right. I start writing a book. Right. You know, I, 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 at one point I was just going to have something happen to one character mm-hmm. that was important, but for me it was just kind of a toss off. But then I make these discoveries about that character enriches that person and makes us feel differently about that person. Yeah, right. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I felt so good at the end of it. And I have to say, I laughed out loud at the end, (laughs) at the ending. I laughed out loud. And there, there's another sequel to Pride and Prejudice that I read years ago because I had never read any Jane Austen until 19, until I saw Pride and Prejudice with Colin Firth and Jennifer Ely. And uh, then I said, why haven't I read any Austen before? And of course, Sense and Sensibility came out about that same time, Emma Thompson's version of it. And so when we were on our trip around the world, I picked up a copy of Pride and Prejudice at one of the airports and read it while we were gone. And then I, when I got home, I just bought one volume with all of the stories, except for, uh, I, for some reason, I didn't read Lady Susan, which they now call Friendship, and I can't remember the title of it. And, and none of Sanditon. None of that was in there uh, because it wasn't a finished manuscript. But so I read all of them fairly quickly, one right after the other, after we got back. And this other sequel has this really funny, funny episode. I mean, it's a tragic thing that happens, actually, to uh, Mr. Collins. And I laughed out loud at it, though. He's riding a horse. He falls off the horse and the horse falls down and sits on him and kills him. (laughs) And I just laughed out loud at that because it's like, that's typical Mr. Collins. You know, that's that's something that would happen because he's like, you know, before they go riding, he's all, oh, I'm such a good horseman. And of course, he doesn't know how to ride at all, really. And that's what happens to him. And so at the end of your book, I was laughing out loud. Oh, good. <laughs> well, I was, I got advice from him. To, I, I was, I had decided to add a little epigram, um Epilogue? Epilogue. And tell some more stuff about what, some things that happen beyond what that, uh, uh-huh. well, you know, things that the events of the story do lead to. Uh-huh. Uh, but she she very easily convinced me that, no, you don't want to do that right now. You just end it the way that it ends. Mm-hmm. Because it's all implied. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. all implied in the way. Well, I haven't read your later versions. I've only read whatever third or fourth yeah, version yeah. of it. Yeah, you I've I've just made I've made some sm- some small changes from from what I had seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's uh, you know, it's that that old thing that you uh, you never end writing a book, you just mm-hmm. stop. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Because well, you just find things that you want to tighten and- change or something yeah and there is such I think there is such a thing as overworking a a piece of artwork so 
when I, the version I read, I thought was perfect. I did not think there was anything that needed to be changed. There were characters I wanted to know more about. And I thought, oh, well, that would make a good sequel book, you know, <laughs> to know more about these characters, these certain characters. Uh, some of the new ones that you introduced are the ones that I was really interested in. So, well, it's, it's, and, and that brings up a, an interesting sidelight that several of the new characters that I introduce mm-hmm. for their surnames. Uh, I, I use surnames from my ancestors. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, and there are a few, a few characters that, that I use the names of, of certain friends. That's cool. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, so some people can, when they read the book, they'll be surprised to come across <laughs> <laughs> their names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's neat. Well, do you have anything else you want to share before we say goodbye? Well, there there is the I'll just mention briefly the the name of the uh, children's story for adults is The Dancing Tyrant. And oh, can't wait to read that. It, it's it's something that I uh rediscovered and it, it comes from something that I had written. I used to be part of a group of people who wrote for children. Mm-hmm. We used to have meetings and, and we, we did publish a couple of books, uh, book collections of stories that had been written by the group, by individuals in the group. Mm-hmm. And... We, we had one for Christmas and I wrote two stories for that. One of which deals with some of the characters that are in the dancing tyrant. Oh, nice. And that's what set up those characters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to, to get that done. Now there, there is at least one, other book connected to the Pride and Prejudice um, books book. I mean, to to my my sequel to Pride. Yeah. And Prejudice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, what happens to one of the characters who uh, disappears from the main story for until the very end. And um, I've gotten several chapters written on that one. Oh, good, great! You'll know which you'll know which one, which person I'm talking about. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. We won't say anything mm-hmm. for your audience until you get your book published, and then we can. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited about that for you. Well, thank you. I think that's pretty much it. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. I've been wanting to talk to you ever since I read your book. Now say the name again, because I always forget. Quiet at Leisure. That is actually a quote from Pride and Prejudice. Right, I know. Yeah, Quiet at Leisure. Quiet at Leisure or Second Impressions. Oh, yes, right. Okay. Quiet quiet at Leisure is something Mr. Bennett says. Mm -hmm. And Pride and Prejudice the original title was uh, First Impressions. Ah. And, and quite often it's published as Pride and Prejudice or First Impressions. First Impressions. So I decided mine would be Quite at Leisure or Second Impressions. <laughs> because, because, because we do discover other things. Mm-hmm. About a lot of the main characters in, in Pride and Prejudice. Mm-hmm. I, I loved writing it. Yes, and I'm just so excited for you to publish it. So Thank I you. wanted to talk to you ever since I read it, and I'm glad we finally got to <laughs> hook up and do this recording. So thank you so much for being my guest. Mm, it's great to be with you. 
Before I go, I'd like to give a big shout out to Podmatch, which I call a dating service for podcasters. Since I joined their platform, I have met so many wonderful people from all over the world, and they make the matches so easy that if you are a podcaster or you have a message that you want to share, you might want to consider checking them out. The affiliate link is at the bottom of my show notes on my website at Sagewoman Chronicles at sagewoman.life. Part of what I love about them is that they promote civil conversations. And can't we use that right now? So if you check them out, tell them Lucinda sent you. I'd also like to invite you to my Patreon community, where we will have chats with authors or creators. We'll have member chats about the stories that they love, and occasionally we'll have extra episodes or uncut episodes of Story Power. So please go check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash story power without the hyphen, all one word. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what you heard, please share it with a friend and give us a review on your favorite podcast app. It will help people find us. And remember, as Philip Pullman said, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, Stories are the thing we need most in the world. Until next time, this is Lucinda Sage Midgordon. Thanks for listening.